I kind of like combat options. Combat right? options, it's yeah. It's kind of succinct. It, yeah, it, it, but it didn't really pop though. You know, like it's it, it informative. But it, I mean, it, yeah, it's not a critical on, hit. But left, like, just a bit. this guy again. How does he always ask when us to move, move to our left? We, I've right, never moved to my right. I don't get it. Okay, so it doesn't pop. Okay, I get okay, it. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 what yeah. about uh, uh, giving fighters depth? I don't know, that sounds more like backstory and yeah, whatever. Yeah, batteries in your microphone. Are you serious? You okay. just change these, dude. Dude, is it always equipment? It's movement always, and equipment. Always equipment. We know how he is. Jeez. Um and the castle, so, can we move the castle? No, the no, no, no. Do, 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 no, we can't move the castle. We can't move the castle. What's this? It just what's can't this happen. Guy? Okay, we're obviously finding new and better ways to fight on set. So why don't we take this into your game and give your players options for combat and tactics on Web DM? That's the book that broke second edition. This episode is brought to you by Dungeon Craft, Castles and Keeps in Cursed Lands. Their Kickstarter is live now. Lay siege to a castle or start a brawl with the royal guard in the middle of the king's court with Castles and Keeps. Cursed Lands is their companion book for Curse of Strahd and has something for all your spooky needs. Create twisted forests, haunted villages, and so much more. We've used Dungeon Craft in most of our home games since we got it, and we love it. Everything Dungeon Craft makes is cool looking, easy to store, and affordable. So get your group some castles, keeps, and cursed lands. Check it out. Link here in the comments and description. Okay, Jim. You? Uh, you see people talk about combat and, oh, it doesn't have my kind of combat. doesn't yeah, have yeah. my weapons. How do we make combat more real Ooh. and exciting? I mean, like, haven't they tried to do that? in the past, yeah, like yeah, yeah. make it more granular. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, That's I do. we started. I do too. When I see questions about like, improving X part of combat, adding something that's not included, whether it's a weapon or a fighting style or whatever. I mean, people send us subclasses all the time. All the time. A lot of them are based around fighting styles or, or sort of mm -hmm. a certain look uh, and approach to combat. And a couple of questions start popping in my mind and I start thinking about, you know, all the games that I played and like, what is the point of combat in an RPG? Right. And like, what are we trying to represent with combat mm -hmm. in, in, in through the rules? Physical you know? conflict resolution, Jim. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've tried our words. Yeah, we used our words. <laughs> we tried our body language. <laughs> now we need to use our bodies. Yeah, yeah. When I think of it like that, it's like, are we trying to emulate, uh, you know, actual martial practice as it's mm -hmm. been experienced in the various historical periods that we're looking at? Are we trying to emulate mythic combat in the sense of epic poetry and literature that comes down through us through our past? Are we trying to represent the more sort of modern action-oriented combat that's in movies and comic books and things yeah, like it's that? Gotten, like, it's gotten a lot more specific since the old days. Right. D&D, specifically, is a game that came out of historical miniatures wargaming. Right. And so it bears a lot of the hallmarks of being concerned with the way historical martial arts have been portrayed, the way armor and weapons work. Mm -hmm. In the early days, the attempt was to sort of like make all of these things work by differentiating the weapons. Right. Right. The idea was that if we if we really detail the weapons and have mm -hmm. a lot of different ways that they interact with each other and the armor, then that will help us sort of like portray a more accurate uh, Yeah, don't bring a foil to combat. a full plate fight. Exactly, right. exactly. <laughs> and so the idea was that uh, it starts with variable weapon damage. You know, in the beginning, all weapons did the same amount of damage. You know, now it's like, oh wait, but a dagger might be a D4 and a pole arm might be a D10. And then like you get the 2D6 for a, <laughs> for a, uh, for a long sword or a great sword, sorry. Mm -hmm. After that, it comes like the weapons versus armor charts, which if you're not familiar with those, were a, a series of charts in uh, first edition that you would cross-reference what weapon you were using, and this was back in the thoroughly exhaustive weapon list days where... Oh yeah, lots I of remember perusing weapons. them. <laughs> right, oh yeah, it was fun. And then you cross-reference that with the type of armor that you are uh, fighting. Now, mm -hmm. uh, in those days, the, the number of combinations to get to a certain armor class was less. Usually you'd be like, oh, it's AC5, let's chain mail. You know, like, right. I just sort of know that. That gave you a modifier to your die roll that you were using, which you were probably looking up on a chart as well mm -hmm. to figure out. And so it was one of those things where if you were willing to put in the work and like add up all the modifiers yourself, mm -hmm. you could do that. But 
as both I've played the game and have heard others uh, experience it, most of these charts were abandoned. They really slowed down play. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and then also there was weapon speed. Yes. And after oh, a while, God. I know in our group, <laughs> that started to get left behind too. Yeah. That meant that you also used the speed factor for spells mm -hmm. and that you were using segments, which were a subdivision of a round. Yeah. Right? I mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> we've dug down on this before. Yeah, we right? have. <laughs> we have. And D&D is not the only game to attempt this. There are others that, that have gone... Uh, uh, and the alternate route, but like the exhaustively detailed combat system mm -hmm. is one of those that personally I find does not deliver the experience that I want from combat at the table, which is fast action, some degree of uh, of basis in in historical experience. Like that that's more for players and DM to have a solid foundation. They understand what's going on, and the allowance for player creativity for mm -hmm. for a flow and a dynamism. Uh, and I find that the bigger and more complex a combat system is, the less that I get that. Yeah. And I get more we are playing this sub-game of the game kind of thing. And it appears that the makers of 5th edition <laughs> yeah. thought that as well because it, it seems seem now that any kind of new like nuance or wrinkle with any kind of combat class, I mean, we're probably going to be talking about fighters a lot. Sure, right? yeah, certainly. Um, but it's done through subclasses, right? There is, a, there is a lot of that, yeah. Like, you have the fighting styles, but if I'm not mistaken, like... Mariner never made it official. You remember the Mariner fighting style? That was awesome. Yeah, yeah there, there's been some others. Tunnel Fighter uh, was another. But for the most part, fighting styles have kind of been very, very broad. And then they get those specifics of a particular type of of approach to warfare or approach to combat through the subclasses, like mm -hmm. you're saying. That plays the 5th edition strengths. It's certainly yeah. sort of in line with how they uh, sort of see the subclasses as having a self-contained like story to them mm -hmm. you know like i find that approach unsatisfying as well because it leads to sort of just class bloat and, and sort of a dilution of, of and, the class archetypes and pardon the pun but a bit of class warfare also. exactly yes <laughs> yeah because if you're tying a certain way of fighting to a subclass then it's like if i'm not of the base class then i can't have access to that, you know, or, mm -hmm. or it'd be like, you know, it's hard to make ranged paladins uh, or, or uh, strength based monks aren't <laughs> really a thing. Like mm -hmm. those sorts of things, which you can imagine characters that would fill in those concepts um, not working. Whereas the approach was like, this is just equipment, the equipment's available to whoever's proficient with it. And then like how you combine that equipment versus like, you know, we'll try that approach. So we've got mm -hmm. these two approaches here, the equipment-based and the class-based, and to me, neither <clears> one of them quite scratched that itch. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I mean, there are some mechanics that, that could use with some, some fiddling. Yeah, certainly. Also. certainly. Uh, but yeah, let's start with, the, with, with subclasses themselves. Sure. Like, one for me is a big one. Yeah. It's a fighter subclass, and, I, and I've actually bought this off of uh, uh, DM's Guild. Yeah, yeah. But the Pugilist. Sure, from, uh, the, from Sterling Ber uh, Vermin. Right? Sterling, Sterling Vermin, Vermin yeah. the Pugilist. We played it a little bit in that uh, Blood and the Chocolate thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that Emma ran, but it was very clunky. Yeah. But it's one of those things where, like, why isn't there in the base game a fighter that's not a monk? He didn't go right. to a monastery. He just right. got drunk all the time. Or yeah. he just liked to fight because he they yeah. grew up with however many siblings, and that's what they did. The rowdy, yeah. You know, I mean, like, Mickey yes. from Snatch. Yes. <laughs> that is a PC fighter. Yeah. He yeah. can get the shit kicked out of him forever yeah. and still beat you yeah, with yeah. his fists. I can see that. Right? I, I certainly see that as a barbarian. Uh, maybe kind of get that, what, through Tavern Brawler and, and Feats? And, I mean, a, right, it, but, a little bit, but like... But like, you don't get the monk. <laughs> I'm going to hit you like a train. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to come at you, bro. You yeah. Know? A pugilist sort of just a brawler, mm -hmm. right, is, is one that I think that D&D hasn't really had a lot of uh, or a lot of success with. Like, yeah. Every edition has had rules for grappling. Some of them are kind of clever and involve you like rolling, you know, your hit dice versus the enemy hit dice and subtracting. All. But they're all sort of clunky and, and uh, separate from the main loop, core loop of the combat system a lot of times. For fifth edition, I look at like hand-to-hand -hand fighting, brawling, wrestling is kind of just a package deal there. And I'm like, man, I want a system that allows me to, you know, have pins and holds and throws and more than just like okay i impose the grapple condition on them i want mm -hmm. i want that and more and like hand-to-hand -hand fighting to me is also kind of a part of that as well i want to be able to throw elbows and knees and punch and kick yeah and have it be more than just like abstracted into a shove action 
you right, know, right. that kind of thing. Or, you know, or <laughs> I, I want to be Muhammad Ali. You yeah. know, like, I want to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Right, yes, <laughs> yeah. You want to, like, knock a dragon out in one punch and yeah. not be because you've found inner enlightenment. No. It's because you're, you're just I, swole. <laughs> I'm just that good. I'm that fast. I'm a prophet. I'm a poet. I'm pretty. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I really like Muhammad Ali. Another one for me, though, is some kind of like dedicated shield master. Mm. Yeah. Where's my shield love? Where's your shield? Where's your Captain Where's America? Where's my Captain America? Where's your Captain America? You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know some people would put him in, in the monk class, maybe. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, Odyssey. Odyssey of the, the Dragon Lords, Lords has that really cool monk they shield have a cool, class. Yeah. yeah and they finally did a monk <laughs> class for it. It's like, I look at that and I'm like, I want to play that. That's really cool, yeah. Uh, but like something for fighters, like something yeah. extra, like that gives you bonuses when you're next to other people with shields because you trained in shield wall formations. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, like that really feels out. The, the story of the fighter. Like, I mean, how I, long have we fought with shields, Jim Davis? I mean, like, shields and helmets are those, are, yeah, <laughs> right. Shields and helmets are those, like, basic protection equipment that you can use in warfare. Like, mm -hmm. even, you'll see them in all kinds of situations. They're kind of like, along with the spear, sort of the basic weapons that we invent for ourselves when we need them. And, like, plus two to AC doesn't cut it for me. It yeah. never has, yeah. you know, that is, that's, that is vastly underselling the usefulness and, and vitality and necessity of a shield until like, like it's, it, they have to invent plate armor for people to really stop using shields that much. And even then they still use them in specific situations. But now you put a shield with plate armor. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're having classes that are based around using your shield as a weapon, using it to fight in formation. I think that would be a good step forward towards like just having these concepts be viable in in, in fifth edition because right now for a shield you got shield master you know, if you if you're using feats and that's kind of it I, I I'm really trying to think off the top of my head the like sort of base options for shield sort of fighters I, I can't think of much like protection style maybe but that's famously. Uh, not a, a solid pick <laughs> for your fighting style feat because of yeah. how it works and, and just sort of if you're playing a fighter then you probably already have a reaction so like now you're you don't get to use that I, I, I'm just I'm left wanting more when it comes to like a solid defensive fighter that's you know uses their shield as part of their mm -hmm. uh, you know part of their fighting style and if you're, if you're curious what this might look like the movie Troy Mm -hmm. with, uh, with Brad Pitt and Eric Bana. It has some really cool fight scenes in it where it's like spear and shield and you can kind of see how this fighting style might look like in, in a dynamic action oriented way. Uh, yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's pretty badass. <laughs> Sticking with like sort of subclasses and, and, and yeah, fighting styles. What do like, you want to see, Jim? I want to see a thrower. Oh God. I want to see someone, and I think this could easily be a, a feat. This could be a whole subclass of perhaps, I, I could see it being ranger, I could see it being fire, I could see it being rogue. I personally would like, like feats and things like that for these sorts of things, because then it allows any of the warrior types to kind yeah. of dip in when they're ready. To me, the, the quintessential thrower, and hear me out, Oh, Desperado, the uh, Antonio Banderas mm -hmm. uh, movie with um, Danny Trejo. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the uh, the the, cr the cross knives and just like you'll die eventually. There you're gonna get riddled with little holes and yeah. everything. But it's the annoyance fact. It's like that every time you you poke your head out, there's these flying little metal things coming at you. Mm -hmm. and just sticking in your arms and your back and your legs. Yeah, and... Mandalorian where they're breaking the prisoner out. Oh, the prisoner yeah. ship is another where he's going right at her, but he's yeah. in full play. Yes. So he's all, you know, yeah, yeah. but she's just, it's a, it's a, it's a deluge of yeah. steel. <laughs> it reaches its culmination in Exalted, which is D&D you know, oh. high tier of the, you know, I'm just going to like shoot a fire hose <laughs> yeah. worth of uh, metal shards at you. But yeah. I expect that from a 24 character. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I, mm -hmm. I would like right. to see a thrower, someone mm -hmm. that uh, hammers, axes, uh, spears, all kinds of things. Eventually, I don't Kitchen know. Kitchen sinks. Kitchen sinks, I mean, it doesn't boulders, matter. Yeah. yeah. Hurled weapons are, to me, integral to combat. You throw something before you go fight them. Even if it's just like a dirt clod that you picked up off the ground. Maybe you hit them in the face and blind them for a minute. Right? You, you might. Know? Yeah. So not pugilism, but uh, like phalanx fighting, shield mm -hmm. formation fighting mm -hmm. is another one where, especially like given the roots of D&D &D and in sort of like military miniatures wargaming, I don't know. I want, I like the idea still of 
going down into a dungeon and just like packing the corridor with a bunch of pole-armed henchmen and fighting your way through <laughs> cramped and dirty uh, dungeons. Mm-hmm. So it really appeals to me, and I, I could see it being... Uh, being the place where you can address the whole, oh, why would they clump up? Because they would get blasted by a fireball, you know, kind of moment where it's like, well, yeah, what if they've covered themselves in overlapping shields? You know, like that could mm-hmm. probably not, <laughs> they might be able to withstand a blast then. Yeah. For you, like any like specific weapons or, or just well, something? Well, I mean, when it comes to like weapons, equipment. I mean, there, there's, there's a... There's a, a, a slew of, of like martial arts weapons that I don't think you just say, oh, it's well, it's just this, but a different version of that. I mean, like when you get to like seven section stabs mm-hmm. or stuff like that, where it's like right. it's kind of a reach weapon, but it also can be used to like trip and entangle. Right. You know, you have to be a, a freaking master. Sure. Yeah. To 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 handle something like that. To go back to shields, differentiating types of shields. Yeah. Like yeah. shields that can be used as weapons with attached weapons. Right. Shields that are larger or smaller based on, you know, whatever, whatever you need them are, for. Whatever your needs are, right? <laughs> exactly. Right? But they're not all, they just don't all give you a plus two. Right. Plus yeah. one, you know. Yeah. Uh, if they're a buckler. Yeah. I don't know. I think something needs to be done with the whip to make it more interesting. I was going to say, the whips, lassos, uh, and, mm-hmm. and, and the like. Bolos, are, things like that. Things like entangling weapons are, are one of those you don't really think of, but there are certain... Uh, warrior cultures where they are a big deal. <laughs> or like the gladiator, like the net and, and, and uh, uh, spear, trident, yeah, or, yeah. Yeah, trident mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. You know, things like that to make it more accessible and uh, to, 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 to to bring this to life. Yeah, you know? yeah, Some, to, something to give people other uh, an option other than am I sword am I sword and shield? Then I'm going to take my D8 sword. Uh, and you know that that is, and if I'm two-handing it, I'm gonna take my two D six greatsword. And like, there comes a point where if if you're not detailing the weapons enough, and there's a good reason not to, because it can bog down the game, then it's kind of like, well, why do we have weapons at all, and why isn't this all just fluff? We all mm-hmm. just do some damage, and whether it's a broken, <laughs> you know, whiskey bottle, or uh, you know, an ancestral blade, I do D eight damage yeah. when I attack. And like that's another sort of end of the extreme, but right now it's this, I feel it's like this, we've got choices, but I don't mm-hmm. see other choices being made. I see a lot of mm-hmm. take your D8 one-handed weapon or your, <laughs> you know, your bigger one if you need it. Weapons require a certain level of mastery and use that like is uh, too abstracted out. Mm-hmm. When you're calling, kind of like, oh, it's just a quarter staff. You know, and I, and I like what they were where they were going with some of the weapon feats. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it's, at least in the UA, I know some of them made it into books. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I know that there was a lot of flack for some of them because they gave uh, bonuses to hit, and then people were like, oh, those are feet tax because optimizers, you know, uh, <laughs> they're going to take it. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, but I, you know, for instance, it makes the spear that feat that was in the UA. It makes the spear a viable kind of weapon from an optimization standpoint and if you are someone like myself where that is a part of but not all that I care about in the character like I want to pick a spear and not look at every time I make an attack with it and go like oh well I am deliberately making a, a choice for a, a weapon that in my mind is like one of the more important weapons in world history the mm-hmm. spear and yet it's a substandard kind of weapon just because of the legacy of of D&D and people's assumptions about how some weapons should be better than others. I, I've got a word for you guys. Like, all weapons are killing people. Yeah. This is the thing about it. There's no weapon that's any better or worse than any other. You don't need that much mm-hmm. to kill someone. The Romans found out you just need, like, two to three inches of steel. <laughs> it doesn't take that much. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the vital organs aren't that deep in. They're there. not that deep in. Mm-hmm. It's, and, it's just and, what you got to get through to get there. Right. And so this whole idea... This whole idea of like that there's some weapons that are better than others in all situations. In, in, in all cases, always, I will always choose a long sword over a spear or a great sword over a, you know, a, a glaive or something like that. To me, that's the part of D&D that's unrealistic. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the part that, that is like, yeah. Oh, you're in a narrow dungeon <laughs> corridor with your giant great sword? Yeah, yeah. Good luck using that thing. <laughs> and again, like a lot of things, these are 
one, at one time or another, these were sort of part of the game and, and spacing, how much space you took up mm -hmm. in a corridor when you were wielding your weapon. Mm -hmm. Not like I'm in a grid and I never leave this five foot box, mm -hmm. but it's like, oh yeah, you got a great sword. No one can stand next to you while you fight. <laughs> You're yeah, swinging yeah. this giant piece of steel around. Right, right. We're kind of getting into some mechanics Oh yeah, we're here. getting all kinds of, we're, we're getting uh, sloppy. But, but, uh, yeah. but do you have any, any equipment that you'd like to see? I mean, coming from a history major, I mean, I'm sure that- So many. <laughs> Yes, yeah. there's, there's a lot. And I, for me, when it comes to like equipment, uh, moving past the spear, to me, helmets are another one of those. They're assumed, I guess, to be part of the armor class, uh, but it's another one of those things where it's like, I really feel like it's been abstracted out a bit much. And I've seen a lot of different ways for people to handle this. Some people go like, well, if you're not wearing a helmet, then like one in six hits against you is against unarmored AC. And it's sort of like, get your head hit. Uh, and others, it's less uh, a drawback in combat and more things like, oh yeah, it's gonna suck for you when rocks fall on your head. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> the people with helmets might live uh, kind of thing. So I'm not sure how I would handle it. Uh, magic helmets, of course, are a way to go with it, but just like maybe they add to certain skills or something like that, intimidation or, or something, I don't know yet. For shields, I think doubling their AC bonus versus ranged attacks is the start. I think the, the main thing for a shield is that it's cover, right? Like it, it provides you cover. It prevents things from getting close to you. And it's not like armor that's right next to your skin. You can hold it out from you. Yeah. And you know, things pierce through it if they, uh, which a lot of weapons are meant to, you know, pierce armor, the uh, <laughs> Like you can have it sort of held out from you. But then when I think of like, if I really wanted to do spears right, or sorry, shields right, or equipment right in general, it would involve having weapons and armor and things break, well, having them, you know, you, get worn out. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you just uh, popped in my mind the, uh, the fight in uh, 13th Warrior. Yeah, where yeah, they, yeah. They're, they're dueling and they have the three shields. Yeah, the three shields, yeah. And it's all about, yeah, you block it, but guess what? Oh, that was a crit? Guess what? Your shield's cut in half. Your shield's cut in half. Now, yeah, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you could do that by saying, like, okay, shields can absorb X amount of damage before they need to be repaired. Maybe they can, you know, maybe it's like a thing that you roll on at the end of every fight. Like, oh, how's your equipment doing? But. Mm -hmm. Something simple, like some kind of endurance meter. Something that happens on a, you know, on when it's your weapon, it happens on a fumble. When it's you getting attacked, it happens when you're crit right. or something like that. But having uh, there be some kind of way for weapons to break, to fall out of your hands in combat. There's a reason you bring more than one weapon. Mm -hmm. There's a reason you chain it to your body. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. <know? laughs> well, I mean, it could be a thing where um, when you're critted on, you can turn that crit into not a crit. When by sacrifice, by, by your sacrifice shield. yeah. That's a classic OSR rule uh, mm -hmm. of just any attack. I don't want to take this damage. I'm gonna sacrifice my shield. One of those OSR rules that I like, just I like, <laughs> I like it for just about anything. It's mm -hmm. a good. It's something fun to give to like a boss, yeah, or something like that, where it's like you're fighting. You know, they're fighting. It's like all right, you, you know, you've changed the situation. They no longer have their shield. Maybe they draw a second weapon and they're two, you know, or two handed or dual wielding or something. Slings are another one of those weapons that are devastating in the hands of, of soldiers who are trained in them know how to use them but they're very poorly represented in in dungeons and dragons and it's also one of those weapons that's kind of like yeah anybody can have this it's just a strap on the rock <laughs> it's just some leather and some rocks you know but if you're using like lead bullets for your slings that you've cast yourself and it's like you have variable length of cord so that you can control the range of the sling where it goes how fast it goes how much space you need there's all kinds of ways that uh you know historical slingers have been put to good use and mm -hmm. uh, because it's a blunt uh object they have this curious effect on when they're used on like knights and other armored cavalry because it's like you might not get through their armor but you're gonna batter them <laughs> with a hail of uh, you know, of lead bullets that are about the size of a walnut. That's going to stop a lot of a lot of enemies. You know, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't necessarily do uh, damage to them. We've talked about firearms before, mm -hmm. and firearms are one of those like things in D and D that people have a lot of very strong feelings on. Strong feelings about. Uh, yeah, even strong... though even though the era that the D and D is based <laughs> off of, there are firearms. They're firearms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if a player wants to play with firearms in my game, yeah, I will usually allow it. Yeah. I normally don't introduce it until a little bit later on my own, if at all. Yeah. Like I, I have no problem with firearms, right? Yeah. You just make them simple. Hey, whatever. Now, with firearms, though, get into the mechanics a bit. <laughs> if you roll a one, that's not going to be good for you. Sure. Because yeah. I'm going to have you roll damage. Yeah, these are experimental weapons. Yeah. 
Yeah. It blows up in your face. Yeah, yeah it blows up in your face. Yeah, and I think like, this is one where I think like having an understanding of uh, the historical development of arms and armor, because the equipment list that you see in the, in D&D represent culturally specific weapons that are created for very specific needs. Yeah. And then they're kind of taken out of that context and presented as these universal things. No, you, you get like the long sword, long sword, only after the end of a certain historical development, same for all pole arms and long bows and all kinds of weapons. Taking firearms and going like, like, well, I'm going to use the firearms from the 1800s because I don't want I want my players to be able to shoot more than once a combat. <laughs> you know, that means that you're mixing and matching things. And then, of course, it's not going to work and you're going to have to extrapolate from that. Whereas I just sort of um, take the opposite approach and go like, what, did, what else was in use at the time? And we'll just use it like that. And if it means the players only get to fire their gun once then they just get to fire at once. Mm -hmm. And maybe they should carry like six of them. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I mean, you know. I would maybe, uh, if, if, if we're going like straight old school firearms though, it, it could be a thing where you do exploding damage. Yeah, Real max damage, that, that, yeah. even though you didn't crit, yeah. you roll it again, you, can throw that, you know, yeah, yeah. but guess what? It's gonna take you f two full actions to reload that. Thing. Yeah, yeah, it takes a lot to reload it. Before we leave equipment, cause we could probably talk a lot more about it. I mm -hmm. wanna say like, for me, Warhammer 2nd Edition is the best system for weapons I've seen. All weapons do the same damage. And they have certain modifiers for it. it might be strength bonus minus four, but you're all rolling the same die. And then it's tags and keywords mm -hmm. that modify what the weapon does, how it can be used. Yeah, if they it's slow, this. if it's impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I believe Dungeon World has a similar system. Uh, and, and, and to me, the weapon keywords are where you put in all of the modifiers versus armor. <laughs> it's where you put in all the weird things that weapons can do. Yeah and you put it in the hands of, of the player to just keep up with what their weapon can do. There are certain mechanics that, that need to be filled out, um, yeah. uh, whether it's weapon uh, abilities. Sure. Um, another one for, for me is uh, actual taunting mechanics. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. should be able to make people be shittier at fighting if you taunt them properly. It seems like and, you get their, yeah, get under their skin. Yeah, get under their skin, mm -hmm. you know, get them not thinking about their tactics, their yeah. plans. Yeah. Things like that, like something a little bit more than what we have. I mean, certain yeah. certain subclasses of different, you know, classes, they, right, they, right, they right. have these kinds of things, you know. Yeah, they're kind of all over. And, and, and like, to me, a taunting thing like that is different than a marking mechanic, like from fourth edition. Mm -hmm. And is even different from like an MMO style taunt. Uh, but it's more of like a psychological thing. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, I'm going to get under my opponent's skin. I'm going to say or do something that irritates them mm -hmm. or that, that uh, you know, causes them to make something, you know, do something rash or something like that. So I would almost like want to create sort of like a reaction chart or something where it's like, yeah, if you qualify, if you do take these steps and qualify, then you'll get to roll on this thing that is going to modify the enemy's behavior. You might cause them to charge forward out of far formation mm -hmm. where they're not supposed to, or cast a spell that they, they otherwise wouldn't, wasting an action or something. Yeah, you get you get the wizard to cast their big spell that you know your sorcerer's waiting to right. subtle counter spell. Yeah, yeah, right? something it's, like that. Yeah. yeah, giving fighters a more of an option than just like move and hit. A lot of times in fighting, when you read ancient battles and stuff, is shouting. Screaming at each other, you might get two uh, ancient armies or medieval armies that like get within, you know, uh, weapons reach of each other. Like mm -hmm. they could they could be launching bolts and arrows and javelins and things like that. Maybe they are throwing rocks at each other. But there's also a lot of just like screaming and shouting. Yeah. There's a lot of hyping each other up yeah. to get ready to do what we're about to do. And the closer they get to each other, the more these sorts of things. That's why there's music in warfare. That's mm -hmm. why there's chanting. That's why they fucking paint themselves. You know, all of these things are about the psychology of, of getting yourself ready to do violence. Mm -hmm. Just put yourself in a mindset of like, I could also be harmed. I mean, I can hear people out there typing comments. Well, that's why the bards are like, yeah. yeah I'm sure bards, sure. But they don't have to be the only if ones. If you're in certain situations and there's no bard around, like why can't you affect people? Yeah. With your words. With your uh, words, yeah. Because, I mean, you should be able to. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it does in real life. We don't have magic. You certainly. Know, it happens certainly. all the time. Yeah, Again, certainly. going back to Muhammad Ali. He got people to do stupid <laughs> shit all the time because he talked shit yeah. the whole time he fought. Yeah. It gives you a reason to take monster languages. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. if you can't oh, yeah. talk Cut. shit to a goblin, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, <laughs> definitely. So yeah. I, I like that kind of thing. What, what, what do you got mechanic-wise? I want a better system for one-on-one -on -one duels Duel. in Dungeons & Dragons. Yeah. I think D&D &D does abstract skirmish combat well enough that I wouldn't make any broad changes to it. Just you know, a little adjustments. But when it comes to like two people, there's not as much dynamism mm -hmm. as I'd like there. And there are other RPGs. Uh, Warhammer is another one we bring up a lot that I think produces fun duels, but they can go on rather long. Uh, the Riddle of Steel uh, was probably the best mm -hmm. dueling game I've ever seen. It involves both players who are going to be fighting each other to have different colored die that represent defense and attack that they keep hidden from each other. And then when the DM sort of calls for it, they both throw their initiative die, the, the number doesn't necessarily matter, it's the color of it. Yeah. And so you can get situations where it's like both of you guys are attacking at once. One's it's gonna defense, be messy. One, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or it's like, okay, three rounds in a row, you guys have both thrown defense. Are you sure you wanna fight each other? Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's, it, it creates those moments of hesitation and if I was gonna use something like that for D&D, &D, that would be the moment where I throw in the taunt. Mm -hmm. Can't, this guy's gone defensive every single time. Can I provoke them into attacking me? I do a quick defense myself and then big guy. Uh, catch him with a counter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With yeah. Counter. no, totally. Kind of touching on other mechanics that I would have for combat that I think would add something is, is, is a fog of war. Like, one of the things that gets me about uh, combat in D&D, &D, especially if you're using visual aids and miniatures and things like that, is the situational awareness that players have. And mm -hmm. there's a part of me that wants to recreate kind of the chaos and hectic, I don't know what's going on. I don't yep. know immediately that we just got mm -hmm. flanked by a bunch of new enemies. I yep. don't know that. The player at the table looking down from the god view. Yes. All. Yeah. I mean, we're talking, PC. if we want to talk about egregious metagaming, like yeah. <laughs> the, the kind of metagaming that goes on in, in a, when combat is rolled is it, often not even thought of as that. You know, it, it's, uh, well, honestly, you wouldn't be able to play that part of the game without it. Uh, but if there's some way you could kind of like introduce something that's like my player or my character doesn't necessarily know what's going on. They're not quite aware. Uh, they need to be told or, mm -hmm. or something. The fog of war kind of uh, mechanic would be fun. And that dovetails into like a mishap. And this is one of those things where I almost want to be like every fight <laughs> there is a layer action. <laughs> and it might be just a... You know, a torch goes out, you drop your weapon, you slip on some blood, you, you know, you go down. They're just all kinds of things that happen to introduce an element of chaos mm -hmm. and unpredictability into what is otherwise a fairly you predictable... You go, then I go, then you go. You go, go. <laughs> I know, I'm going to walk this many grids, it, you know, squares, it doesn't change, yeah. this is how many attacks I get. Very neat, very orderly, something that kind of makes it up, as well as introduce movement and, and, and sort of motion into combat. Last one of these, and, I, and this deserves its own show, Mounted combat. Oh God! I just uh, this is what my degrees in, folks. This is why I got my <laughs> my master's degree in is in uh, the show just started. Medieval so. massive warfare. <laughs> no. So I don't want to go too far off on a subject, but it is I have not seen it covered well. Yeah. In in, in any RPG outside of Pendragon, Pendragon yeah. is the one RPG I've played where I'm like, okay, mounted combat feels like it should. And guess what? It's about playing knights. In King Arthur's court, it should feel like mounted combat means something there. Right. I mean, it was cavalry was around for a while. And Certainly, it still I'm, is in it still a different is in, form. In many ways, yeah. Right. You know, they, but mobile cavalry. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I try not to dwell on it. Uh, also, the the sort of like the way that combat and most D and D games work, there's not as many mounted uh, opportunities for mounted combat. That's a shame. But yeah. uh, I would, I'd, I'd make a lot of changes to that. Okay, so in, in kind of wrapping all this up sure, in, sure. In, in, uh, in the end, how do we take all these things into consideration and kind of elevate combat to where it feels more real and, yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah. and everything? Like, what do, you, what do you think? I think, like, understanding what you want out of combat. Mm -hmm. Understanding, like, what it is as a player in DM that you enjoy out of this, what it's supposed to represent. Does this represent some kind of historically rooted you know, systemic violence kind of thing, or is this just like action, <laughs> balls to the wall, we don't mm -hmm. care about any of that stuff, give me the surfboard sword. Kind of thing, like knowing what you want, what your group wants is gonna be step one. And then it's, a, to me, it's about integrating these changes that you're gonna make to sort of adjust the combat system to your liking, like making it reflected in the world. Really like drawing these things together and going like, all right, who teaches these fighting techniques in the world. Is there like a monastery or a school or something like that? If there's one, are there multiples? Are they rivals? You know, quick example from history is just like the difference between Spanish and Italian dueling. 
oh, yeah. and how it develops in the Renaissance and early modern era. And they're completely different philosophies on it. Extrapolate that from, you know, is this Northman axe fighting or dwarven axe fighting? You know, what's the difference here? Um, there were some cool supplements in third edition, the um, uh, Sword and Fist, and mm -hmm. then uh, the Complete uh, Warrior had some like fighting style feats that suggested that there were like martial arts with philosophies and history and the like behind them within these worlds. Of course, Book of Nine Swords uh, really develops that. Oh yeah. And so that's, that's what I would do. Introducing tournaments, jousting, uh, festivals, uh, warfare, like actually having the, the warriors and fighters in your uh, campaigns participate in, in battles and the like, uh, all of those things and mixing them with the fantastic elements of D&D, magic, the gods, all those is, is what elevates it mm -hmm. and, and what turns your, <laughs> you know, dirtbag first level uh, rando fighter into a mythic hero who overcomes obstacles and uh, people sing legends of. You know, that's what we want. Hell yeah. You know, yeah. That's how you go hilt deep. Boom. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. My name is Alex, my name is Alex, my name is Alex, my name is Alex. Pop, 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 pop. Ding, 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 ding. Sweet deans.